This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast Show 743. I bought the land right, so the land was actually two parcels being sold together, but no one figured that out for some weird reason. I ended up selling half of the parcel, or half of one of the yeah. one of the two parcels. And um, so all in, I was at 381, and the appraisal came in at 565,000. That's very cool because a lot of people, like the journey to build this house, very hard, but once you do it one time, it's like, eh, it's actually not that hard to build a house like, again and again and again. And you built, you know, like $200,000 of equity or something like that, just doing that. What's going on, everyone? This is David Green, host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast, here with my partner in crime, Rob Abasolo, and our guest, Janice Stitzer, with a fantastic episode that we recorded together in Denver, Colorado. In today's episode, we get into all kinds of cool stuff, including leaving one market and getting into another market, moving your money from a market that might be crashing into one that you think will have a run, and a trending topic, new build construction, the new burr, B-U-R-R-R. <gasps> Newber, just the Newber, N U B E R. I just coined it. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Save That's what life. I'm here for. Before we get into today's fantastic episode, I want to tell you one listen all the way to the end. If you've ever wondered about the origins of the word podcast, we solved that riddle for you today. And two, our quick tip of the day is going to be newer folks. Listen to how we talk in the beginning about how real estate felt way too expensive and we didn't want to get into buying it and we had all kinds of fears and we tried to save money on contractors and all these other ways that ended up just costing more money. And experienced people, there's a ton to learn here for somebody who's wanting to know about permitting, zoning, new home construction, what goes into construction, easy ways you can get ripped off by contractors or rip yourself off by doing things in the foolish way, buttering bread and training dogs. All of that and more in today's show. Today's guest is Janice Stitzer. This LA native started off in the finance world. Janice didn't find the magic in working at Disney and Fox. It was just a corporate job and she was built for more than that. Searching for alignment to her interests while house hacking and ADU in LA, Janice landed a job at a discount brokerage in 2005, 2006, where high volume and saving deals became the norm, but she saw the writing on the wall about how the housing market was shaping up. She and her entrepreneurial focused husband sold the house and moved to Denver in 2006, where they knew no one for a better cost of living and a chance to start a family. It sounds like the perfect way to get started. Janice, welcome Lever. to the show. Thank welcome you. Welcome to the show. Thank perfect. You. That's good. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I uh, I read it right off of the notes here. <laughs> I was going to say, did you just come up with that? <laughs> All right. So take us back in time. When you first sold that house in LA with the ADU, what did that afford you? What, what doors did that open? That was our seed money. We, it was difficult to get into that. It was when we purchased that house, we set out, it was the ADU was the target. We knew that that was going to be our ticket to affording the house, Just much living, like you. living at all. Living at all in the Los Angeles market. Yeah. And so we found it. It was a stretch. And that was when the mortgage market was giving out money. I mean, down payments with a credit card. Whoa. And yes. Is this our no first seasoning? success story of the 2005 to 2006? Is it? Yeah. You didn't lose everything, right? You actually no. got out, timed it well, put the money into yeah. the better market, right? Yeah. So we bought that house um, with a credit card down payment because we did not have any money. My husband just started a gym business and I was I had just recently graduated from college, new into the corporate world, trying to figure that out. And so um, we did ask around for for family money, but... They said no. They're like, you know what? You guys are an ad- you're adults, and you I, we're not going to do this. So, but that was what was going on at that time was free so money. This is relatively significant because I feel like back in this was two thousand and five or that was two thousand and three four okay. when we bought the property. So back then, ADUs weren't really no, nearly as popular as they are. No, now. no, this was. A main house, uh, a garage, and then the uh, granny unit on top of that. So um, it was it was a needle in a haystack, so to speak. It was already built. It was okay. already built. It was turnkey. We really didn't have to do anything. Not that we could have afforded to do anything, mm. 
Um, but we we had a we had a network of people, and one of the one of my husband's clients was like, "This is a good one. If you don't buy it, I will." And so that was our that was our sign. Like we have to do it. We have to jump into this. It, however we can afford it, we're going to find a way. And this was pure necessity. You weren't intending to be a real estate investor. You didn't have a great plan. You just knew I want to live in LA. It's really expensive. The only way we can make this work is if we buy a house with several units and rent out some of them and live in the other one. Right. There was intent behind it for sure. But even you know, even back then, three fifty three hundred and fifty thousand was a significant amount of money. That's what it cost back then? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's crazy. Yep. This is why I'm always saying that housing always feels expensive. When you buy it, it doesn't yep. matter. It always feels like you pay too much. Yep. And when you look back twenty years, thirty years, you're like, Can you believe that we were only paying a million dollars for a house? Because houses are gonna be four million dollars. Mm-hmm. It's true. Time. I was scared when I bought my house in LA. <laughs> I was scared to talk about it with people. I was scared to talk about it with my family. I didn't want them to know. I was terrified to tell them how much it cost. And back then it seemed expensive. And now it would be really, really cheap to buy what we paid for it. So, right. okay, so right. you got in early, quote unquote. Early. <laughs> and then, yeah, fast forward two years, we're like, okay. My career changed. Not that it even had any footing. I was, like I said, I, you guys know, Fox and Disney tried the corporate thing out for my parents, checked that box off. And I was like, I do not like this. It's Mm -hmm. not for me commuting an hour and a half, two hours one way. And And that's about like a two mile drive. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you guys are in no California Encino to, to um, either Burbank or um, over at Fox Studios across the hill, 405. That was a nightmare. That, I think that was really the, the straw that broke the camel's back. I'm like, this is... So the quality of it. life sucked. It sucked. Yeah. It sucked. You didn't Absolutely. want to raise a kid in that area. You were tired no. of the commute. You were doing well financially, but you weren't happy, right? No. no. So you decided to move. Tell us how you made the decision of where you were going to go. We were thinking of moving... Um, Within the Los Angeles area, everything that we looked at was a lateral move for double the price. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what? We're just, why wait? At this point, um, I still tried to make it work. We put in a couple offers. um, And at that point, I was working for two real estate agents and things were nutty, completely nutty. It was 05. Oh five, oh six. Yeah, this was the peak of the hottest peak. market. Even people peak. think the markets we've had have been hot. They weren't as hot as it was in 05, really? 06. Yeah. I mean, we were juggling 20 transactions at the same time. So um, I was already thinking we need to start. We need to sell. Yeah. You know, just take some money off the table. If we're going to start somewhere else, we're going to do it now. So were you reading any of the writing on the wall? Were you seeing the oh, teachers sure. buying million dollar homes yes. and the no income loans? And the, I mean, at that time, they were just building developments everywhere. I mean, everywhere you look, they were just putting up new homes. Like, could you just see this is going to end badly? It was It was just so easy to, to sell anything. Hmm. And the brokerage I worked for, um, they're no longer around, but um, they were trying to basically have the commission be a total of 3%. So other brokers, agents didn't want to play that game. Yeah, You know, it's one thing if an agent decides to take a little bit of a discount, but to f- suggest that the other buying or listing agent, you know, or the buyer's agent. Take. So what you're saying is typically real estate transactions or real estate commissions, I should say, the agents are going to split whatever it is. So if it's 6%, one agent gets three, the other agent gets three. Right. Your brokerage was trying to do 3% total, which meant that the buyer's side was going to be getting a significantly lower portion, one, one and a half percent. Right. And it's hard to get a, a buyer's agent to show your homes if they're getting half the commission that they could get on a different house. Right, right. right. But at that, you know, at that market, and we were already, the inter- internet was already established. People were starting yeah. to... To get on Zillow and Redfin, I think, was starting to be established maybe back then. Um, so people had access to that stuff. That was a big change because it, was. it used to be if you tried to give only a percent and a half to the buyer's side, none of the agents would show your house. So you would lose money. But when Zillow came along, the buyers see the house on Zillow. They tell the agent, go show me that house. And the agent's like, what am I going to say? They've no. also leveraged in that That's scenario. exactly what yeah. happened. So I mean, that it's opened not the door. ethical, but... You- they of course they want to earn their standard or suggested standard commission. So, 
Um, but things were just selling. I mean, you multiple offer situations, m- much like what we experienced mm-hmm. the past two years. So there's a lot of um, mirroring between now and 08, I feel like. So you knew it was time to get out of Dodge. How did you decide that Denver was the new place you were going to go? My husband. I, I would have never imagined leaving L.A., because I was born and raised there. I knew nothing else. And um, he's from the East Coast, moved to LA for for a little while. That's where we met. But he's been to Colorado numerous times and basically said, let's let's move. And it's not, the winters aren't that bad. (laughs) (laughs) Cut to 2023 and it's five degrees outside. Yeah, I just went for a short walk outside and there's snow everywhere and my shoes were soaked and now my socks (laughs) and my feet are freezing as we're recording. I'll let you borrow some socks. I appreciate that, man. Would have thought the Rocky Mountains were rockier than this. (laughs) I'll give you the socks I'm wearing off my feet. Thanks, man. Some people give you the shirt off their back. I'll give you you the socks socks off off your feet. feet. Did you wear two pairs of socks? (laughs) Yeah, my feet are getting sweaty. But the, the first pair, you know, those are the sweaty ones. I'll give you the dry ones. Right on. (laughs) <laughs> so what's funny is that you got out of a hot market in Southern California before it crashed, and then you got into the Denver market, which then became one of the hottest markets in the country I, a couple years that's later. That's because all the Californians are moving yeah, here. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> strategy. See where Californians are going is get there first. I've been saying that right. for a long time. So when you got here, like, what did you guys do to start over? You, you're no longer working for Disney and Fox. Your corporate career has switched. How did you guys decide to make a living? Uh, well, my husband's a third generation contractor, so we figured, okay, if anything, that will be our fallback. Okay. Um, but we came to Denver with the plan of buying, refinancing, renting, and repeating. And at that point, Denver was already seeing REOs on the MLS. So, what's an REO? Just for everybody, real estate owned. The bank already took it back and put it back on the market Mm -hmm. on listing. So that process takes quite a while, and for that to, I mean, the the MLS was full of REOs. So we were just we were picking up properties, um, Denver bungalows for seventy five to a (laughs) hundred thousand. (laughs) <laughs> no, let me and ask this you. is at the height of the foreclosure, which is crazy, right? Crazy. Did your husband think that you were paying too much? No, I because mean, you, you were coming from, from three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand dollars houses, yes. right? So these yes. seem like they were free. Exactly, because we coming from LA, the house, the main house we lived in was a thousand square feet, mm. and these bungalows were about that. For a quarter of the price. For a quarter less. of the price. And this is where the all the people who already live in Denver are like, yeah, you Californians keep coming here. Those houses would still be 75 grand if you guys didn't come here and drive up all the prices. So there's a downside to it as well. Yeah, I think Denver people are people in Denver like that. Everyone in Texas is like that. Yeah. Everyone in Tennessee. That's the other, Anywhere you anywhere go. the Californians move to. Yes. <laughs> exactly. All the places where people make the most money in real estate, yeah, we Californians make it unaffordable. But it's not like California trended down either. No. That's true. Inflation, man. Everything everything goes up. So you come here. How many of these houses were you buying? Were you just buying a couple of them or did you go all in? We were buying a couple. So we were doing all of the rehabs ourselves. Okay. So you can only go so fast. We can only go so fast. We were, And for the most part, they were cosmetic. So not even replacing cabinetry. Paint, maybe new countertops, mm-hmm. new appliances. We throw them. 15, 20 grand into it. And even at that time, we were able, so we paid cash. We funded the, the renovations with cash, went up to the bank and refinanced it. You're you were doing Burr, Burr before yeah. we called it Burr. Yeah. Did you guys have a name for it back then? I don't know. Like Fix it. Just flipping a house? Yeah. Fix and flip and rent. Yeah, re- we, so, didn't, we weren't cl- that clever to coin the term Burr or else... Or else I, you would have. I'd yeah. be in your seat. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right. It was all the, the coining of the term. So you, uh, I, I'm, I want to know because you said that this was sort of like all the foreclosures were already starting to pop up and everything like that. Was it really hard to burr? Because like were ARVs being affected by this? Because I know a lot of people right now that are flipping and they're basing all of their values based off of values from a year ago. And so there's a little bit of discrepancy there mm-hmm. right now for a lot of flippers. Was that the case back then too? You know, the price discrepancy wasn't that great um, because we were able to pull all of our cash out. Mm -hmm. So 
for for one reason or another, there wasn't this huge discrepancy where um, the delta between ARV and re- you know renovating was. I, I just think that there were too many people who were afraid to go back, come back in. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's there's some shell shock, some PTSD from. You get exposed to real estate, you see the values shoot up. Everybody runs in there. It's like a gold rush, and then. Phew, the bottom drops out. So many people were not wanting to buy. That's actually when I got into the market mm-hmm. is I was, I didn't know any, I mean, I should say I didn't know any better. I didn't buy when prices were going up, but I didn't have that same emotional fear of the bottom dropping out. And I stepped in into the bottom. So what you were doing is you're buying these properties at 75 to hundred grand, putting 15 to 20 grand into them. They're appraising at what? Like 130, 140 or so? 150, yeah. 150. It's, and then you're was, doing was a cash out spot. refi. Yeah. Right? Yep. So you're getting hundred percent of your capital out. You go buy the next one, which is is a great efficient method, but it can only scale so fast because right. you have to do the rehab yourself. You have to wait to get your money out before you go buy the next house. And right? you're using your own capital to do this. Exactly. Right? At yeah. this point, we didn't we didn't know what we know today with all the information that that's out mm-hmm. there. Anything that we know, we read in books or yeah. um, maybe heard word, word of mouth. mouth. Yep. yep. Isn't yep. this crazy? Like, there's so much information out there. This stuff gets around. It's so different quick. today. It's way different, and I think I don't know if maybe we were either too dumb to know. We were just like, okay, we're jumping in, we're doing this. Well, who wouldn't do that? You're getting a hundred percent of your money out. You're getting a, a rehab house that's going to cash. You flow. would think, but yeah, there was a there was a lot of hesitancy in this market, in the Denver market. That in what year was this for reference? Two, roughly, uh, two thousand six seven. Oh, oh, okay. So it was like it, as soon as everything started, kind of. Caving yeah, we bit. yeah we left a market that was still hot. Came to Denver and it had already happened. Mm. So, and I think the other thing about the Denver market, which was unlike Cal- the LA market, was that the the um, valuations didn't weren't as high. People weren't able to use their homes like credit cards. Yeah, and that's the downfall of what was happening in the 08 crisis. All the HELOCs that people were yeah. taking out there, buying boats and cars and mm-hmm. RVs and vacations and renovations and adding pools. and Right, right. So that was the bigger, that was also the other thing driving California in that market, okay. which wasn't as apparent here. So you had something that was working. What mm-hmm. made you switch that up and get into something bigger? Well, the mortgage crisis, we, start, we did that numerous times and then hit a roadblock. One of our last transactions was Oh yeah, we came to the signing table. They they changed our LTV, our loan to value, so we had to leave money in the deal, mm. and that was they the lend the lending just stopped. At so that you point. weren't able to refinance to get your money out of these deals. We got the, the final one, which scared us, was the one that they changed the they changed the rules of the game. So you realized you could no longer continue as yes, as you had. yes. But you didn't lose money. You just left money in the house. Yep. Yep. That's right. You've done this a few times, right? Where you leave, you may not be able to get the full ARV up or the full LTV. And yeah. You but see, I think equity. the difference is I knew if that happened, it was like I made a mistake. The ARV wasn't as high as I thought. The rehab was too big. I think what you're describing is that the lending pipeline shut off to mm-hmm. where you weren't going to be able to do cash out refis at 75% loan to value. Right. Because uh, the LA market came crashing down, mm-hmm. and I, the lenders and and the whole um, was that big, too big to fail, too big to fail the thing. Big short, is that you're talking yep, about the movie. exactly. That that whole debacle just everything came to a halt. So right. what happened is everybody started going into default. The, yep. the banks ran out of money to keep lending and mm-hmm. then, then they got scared that that was going to keep happening. So they were like, nope, don't lend at all. So even if you do the perfect burr, you're not able to even get the money out of the deal. They're just not doing home loans anymore right. for investment property. At least right. they probably still had some primary residence type of thing. So what did you move into? So we moved full on into construction. Okay. And, like a business? And uh, yes, establishing a business and going into uh, that as our main as our, basically our W2. Were you okay. building for other people We were not building for other people. We went into um, roofing specifically. Oh, okay. And because, um, yeah, I, at that point, builders weren't building. They weren't building new inventory. So we, the captive audience was people, were people who have, who were able to stay in their homes. Yeah, so I was going to say, like, people always need a roof. Yep. Right? I mean, yep. maybe there's like, 
you know, flippers that aren't doing as much Not renovation. Do a bathroom stuff, remodel, maybe. But, but yeah, you right. Yeah, but you still need a roof, just like you always need to get taxes done. There are certain kind of industries that I feel like, regardless of what's going on. Well, there's a lot of snow out here too. There's a lot roofs, of snow out here. Can't roofs confirm. take a beating. It's yeah. not like we're working right. in California. Yeah. You could have a literal hole in your roof in California. It's only going to matter years. like four times yeah. a year. Yeah. We go, I go back to California. I go, what? People have roofs that look like they're 50 years old. I've been trying to get you to patch that hole in your ceiling for like two years now, man. You just got a bucket. It's so much cheaper. <laughs> it's like a thousand bucks, dude. Just <laughs> spend the thousand dollars and get some socks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you start this this construction business and you're moving out of the uh, investing world into more of a business world. So what role were you playing in the company at that time? At that time, I was the back end, okay. back office, doing what I do, what I know, the financial piece of it and managing everything else on the back end. So your husband's getting leads, giving bids, yep. securing jobs, managing the workforce. They're going in there, swinging the hammers. You're collecting payments, managing accounts receivable. Yep. Uh, logistics, a, a organizing, a full-fledged construction business. Right. How quickly did it take? Did it take off, or how quickly did it? Take you know, to build it's that? it. It took off because here's why: in Colorado, we have hailstorms, and so it's it's almost a yearly event. We can't predict it, but you know, when insurance covers mm. your roof, yeah, and all you pay is your deductible. That's a great point. It's easy to get people to spend money when it's yeah. insurance money. Yeah, and you're improving, you're improving uh-huh. your house. So that's brilliant. We did that for a while until I was. I said, you know, we we probably should pivot. We can't rely on something that's so niche that is weather dependent mm-hmm. because it's yeah. probably exhausting. Also, right? Oh yeah, yeah. You never get out of that, and, and it's you're always somewhat seasonal too. Yes. It's like very imagine, seasonal. Right? Yeah. It's very seasonal. Okay, so you you realized you, you made some money, I'm assuming, doing this, right? So yes. you've got some more capital set aside. Mm-hmm. You've got your rental properties that are doing well. How did you decide your next investing venture? Well, along the way, we we did have a couple of other investors that we said, hey, you know, we're in the Denver market. There's still a little bit of room. We we can partner up or we can do some of the rev- renovations. Um, and we learned pretty quickly that if we didn't have an equity position, we're just – earning a paycheck. Mm -hmm. So um, we did a a few of those uh, in between. And um, the other, the other burrs that we kept, those were just passive. And that was just running in the background, basically. Um, And uh, going back again to the information, I I think that my zest for knowledge was, it just kind of whittled. And I just went passive. And I had this belief that I needed to pay off the loan. Mm. And so I started getting aggressive with that. And for a while, that was really the goal until um, I think podcasting became a thing, starting to get new information. I'm like, oh my God, why am I paying off this loan? Why am I doing that? And that was, you were paying off the loans on all your burrs? Yeah. Yeah. Which, now, that makes total sense. So you sort of felt like you'd hit the end of the road. You're like, well, we've done everything there is to do. What's left? Might as well just pay off the loans. And then you start listening to podcasts and all these ideas are coming out and strategies other people are using and opportunities and your mind just starts firing with the possibility. And you shake your head like, what am I doing? Mm-hmm. There's more to be done, right? So yeah. so what was the next step? Um, so the next step after I snapped out of it was I need to get – strip these properties, strip the equity out of this pro- these properties so that I could get the velocity of money going and acquire more. So that was my next step is we're going to do Burr version 2.0 mm-hmm. out of all of these properties, it, you know, strip the, the equity and um, just grab whatever I can. Um, and once COVID hit, I was like, you know, we need to really change things up. We want, I want to go into development. Wow. So you're, this is kind of like the concept of return on equity, right? Where mm-hmm. you're starting to realize I've got all this money sitting in my bird right. and all my different properties. It's not making me any money, but it's there exactly. it's adding to your wealth. But you want to actually take the money out of that so that you can reinvest it into other things. That's sort of like one of your big re- revelations at this time. Yes, exactly. 
And just understanding the fact that if I strip the equity, grab that equity, and even if I have to leverage, if I get covered debt, that's really all that matters. You know, cash flow Mm -hmm. on top of the covered debt. Mm -hmm. So because during COVID, I think we all kind of went through a personal I don't know. Revolution. Revolution yeah. Yeah. of whatever that, that might be. We all wanted to be closer to nature. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. I just went and bought 12 acres of land, and I said, I'm going to build an A-frame. Just randomly? Like you just, were just like, I'm going to Well, you know what acres? it was? I was it, I was looking through a Dwell magazine, and I don't know if you guys have heard of Den Outdoors. Of course, yeah. I, they, my, I think my, they launched yeah, during COVID. They did, yeah. So, My, Mike is uh, the the founder, and he was very like very fast about it. His designs are really, 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 really good. They're awesome. I mean, to the point where that, however, his marketing team is, mm-hmm. or whoever does his renderings, masterful. yeah, it's all in house. Yeah, I'm building a den right now. Really? Mm-hmm. Or we're like getting it quoted right now, but Ooh, we want to build it. That's exciting. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that article in Den. I'm like, I have to have that. And so that's basically you know, one of those things where it was so quick. You hear people say that, right? It's, it's this gut reaction where it's like, I have to do that. So when, when in, I had stripped all the equity out, sitting on some cash on the sidelines going, okay, well, let's do this. Was it a problem pulling from your cash flow? Because I'm very much a big fan of the return on equity aspect, but since you're doing this full time, you know, you're a full time real estate construction investor, right? And so you're living off of the cash flow off of a lot of your burrs, I, I imagine. But when you we weren't, oh, you weren't. We weren't. Okay. We were. That's we, it was. It went to go. Pay, back oh, okay, you into were just paying, applying it straight. Yeah, right. back into the the loan. So, um, yeah, for a while we were just uh, not thinking really. And I'm curious because starting at like 2005 and 2006, what was that interest rate journey? Like, was it high back then? And then like, because I know 2020 was like really, really low, right? We're in the threes, we're in the yeah. fours, obviously now well, we're in the sixes. Yeah, or sevens. on a couple of them, I had a refinance 3.0. <laughs> so I, that's what happens when you buy into a market that's at the very lowest point. Not that I knew but that's the opportunity that you have and and the advantage. So because the, the second time, the rates were just so low that you how can you not? Mm-hmm. You can't afford not to. You can't were you doing cash out refis or were they rate and term to get lower payments? The second one was rate and term. The third one was a cash out refinance. Okay. So you bought 12 acres. You built an A-frame on it. How did that property end up doing? This It's the same magic. We built it for 350 was the build cost. That, that's like the top number one questions that I get on my DMs. Like, how much did this cost? Um, I bought the land right. So the land was actually two parcels being sold together. But no one figured that out for some weird reason. I ended up bu- selling half of the parcel or half of one of the, yeah. one of the two parcels. And... Um, so all in, I was at three eighty one, and the appraisal came in at five hundred sixty five thousand. So, it's the burr build, yeah. the The build, refinance, rent, rent, or in my Beat. case, STR. The burster, yeah. the burr. I love it. So this was a short term rental that you built this A frame. Yes, I mean it, the there were some personal preferences of like, yeah, I get to enjoy this too. Oh yeah. But sure. I mean, it was used as a short-term rental when you weren't using it. Right? Oh yes. For and that sure. was the the plan when you built it or were you? That was the plan. Cause I, again, I'm all about covered debt. And if someone else is paying for, for my mortgage, then I'm all over it. If I, I mean, this was the original idea of the VRBO is you take a vacation exactly. rental you want to use. And when you're not using it, you let someone else do it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, back then breaking even was like, you know, you get this house, yeah. you break even, you're like, woo, I Someone have else a free is pay- I have a free house. That's exactly yep. It's yep. crazy that not only do we get a free house, we get cash flow on the free house with $200,000 of equity, and then we're still picky. Like, well, it used to be better. 
<laughs> used to be easier to do than it's doing right now. So were you nervous to get into the hospitality industry when before? Oh, you, yeah. Yeah. So tell me what that was like. I, that's part of the reason. I mean, that's actually the main reason why I joined Rob's host camp because I had no clue. I'm, I went for something that was so passive that I, for, I forgot about it, literally, to something that I knew that was going to be so active. And I just wasn't set up for understanding what needed to be done from just operational wise. Mm-hmm. I didn't know the ins and outs of what was out there, the the different hosting or um, even Airbnb was somewhat of a, a of a learning curve. Yeah. So, um, he, so I mean, you you did just fine though. Like I know I know well, about this property. It seems like it's doing okay, right? Oh yeah. I mean, um, it, we actually only launched it this fall, so it did. This whole thing was built during COVID, and that was the other tricky part about this is that we we basically overpaid for materials mm-hmm. we overpaid oh, yeah. for lumber for for lumber for logistics transportation er, everything and it still worked out it's very cool because a lot of people like the journey to build this house very hard but once you do it one time it's like it's actually not that hard to build a house like, again and again and again and you built you know, like $200,000 of equity or something like that, just doing that. And I think the math on this is really crazy that if you just did that Mm -hmm. five times, you become a millionaire in -hmm. real estate. Well, at the same time we were building this, we also were doing um, another burster, but not build, a buy, renovate, the traditional sense. But um, we intended to short-term rental that as well. And that didn't do as well. I mean, not everything can be a home run. Mm Mm-hmm. But um, that one was a nail biter because it, it's just not the same valuation when an appraiser looks at a property that's built in the 1960s. It's that's when it was built versus mm-hmm. something that's brand new construction. They just view it differently. So you say it didn't do as well. You're not talking about cash flow. You're talking not about cash flow. Like the value of it was worth when you the were with the renovation. Oh, okay. The yeah. ARV. Yeah, that is a good point. I think appraisers don't like seeing that you bought a property for two hundred thousand and the comp show five fifty. They just don't like giving you that value. I mean, I don't like paying for it either. When I'm like looking at Zillow, I'm like, they just bought that for yes. five hundred thousand dollars less two months ago. <laughs> and I'm always like, no, Rob. It's if it pencils out, it pencils out. Yeah, but that's true. It's really and, and, hard, and to you don't know how much money they put into it or how much time they put into it. But when you're built building something, I do think that appraisers are more likely to. There's nothing making it hard for them to give the. Mm-hmm. They're probably going to give it more than the value of something that already exists because it's a new construction. So, one of the things that I would think you guys seem like you're pretty locked in with being able to tell what it's going to be worth when it's done. But what about the cash flow? Did you have hesitation about knowing what kind of revenue that property was going to bring in? Again, I'm going to defer back to Rob because, you know, he built his tiny house in Joshua Tree and there's really not, it's like a blue ocean strategy. If you guys have ever read that book, mm-hmm. yeah, there's not really a tangible, there's no comps out there. Mm-hmm. You're, you're making your own comps. Yeah. If you're the first one in a market like that, especially for a unique build, it's really hard, right? Like you have, you, there's a little bit of, it goes back to the art and the science Right now, at this moment, there's this church that I'm looking at that's been completely renovated. It's a six-bedroom church. It's like 7,000 square feet, and I want to turn it into an Airbnb. But there is not a single comp that corroborates the success of what this church could be. But I know that you know if you build it, they will come, right, for, for the yeah. most part. And yeah. so I'm very close to pulling the trigger on that. But I'm just like, it's hard being the pioneer sometimes. But you just got to lean on your past experiences sometimes to sort of guide your decisions, I think. Yeah, there there really isn't any guide. There's I I will still refer to market comps and use that as, as my guideline as well if I have to leave money in the table or equity in the deal, then I'm okay with that. I, that's how I went into the A-frame with that that point of view. Somebody does have to be first. I've often thought about this with oysters. Who cracked open? <laughs> A no, sea I don't rock know. <laughs> and looked at that sea booger and was like, that might be food. That's probably going to taste good. 
Joe, you you eat that first. Yeah. Once you see everyone else eat oysters, you're like, okay, I'll eat an oyster. But somebody had to do. That I see first. people eating oysters, and I still don't eat no, oysters. No, they're disgusting. I don't <laughs> like them either. Come on, I love but a good see, blue people, point. Some people love I oysters. I love oysters. So be the oyster. Well, one of the blind spots I feel like when you're getting into the short-term rental industry is literally I don't know what it's going to rent for, and that is scary. We see this a lot with the medium-term rentals that are going out. That's like I quit get this question all the time. How do you know what it's going to go for? But you don't. You don't get that same security that you get with traditional rental properties because you're getting an upside, because there's no ceiling. It could go great for you. Don't ever get to have both. Building new construction properties is a similar pattern. When you're buying something that's already there, there's only so many things that could go wrong and most of it can be found on an inspection report, right? The roof, the plumbing, leaks, electrical. And if you know what you're doing when you're looking at a house, these surprises don't happen. If you have a person look at a foundation, it's not very often that, oops, turns out the foundation's crumbling and we just didn't see it. There is no foundation. Oh my gosh, we messed up. Yeah, exactly. How did we not notice this? There's no slab. Most mistakes that come from rehabs of existing properties were sloppy due diligence. Okay. And that's not to criticize anyone. That's just what happens. And you learn your lesson. It doesn't happen. New construction is different. You have much less control over how things are going to go because there's so many more moving pieces. So what are some of the other blind spots that people need to look out for if they're thinking, you know what, this market's too expensive. I'm just going to build my own house. I would say even given that the fact that we're in construction, we hired a general contractor for the area. There's a market up there. And um, I mean, this is located in, in a mountain town, small town, and those people, those contractors, those subs do not market. Mm-hmm. I mean, even in Denver, you have good subs. They do not market on Google. They're all word of mouth. Oh, if they were on Google marketing, they wouldn't be available as a good sub anymore. Yeah, <laughs> It's so hard to find. No one them. answers the phone in this industry. <laughs> yep. So, and we're two hours away, two and a half hours away. And for us to manage it is just not, it. it's not smart, number one. Um, and even though we were, probably uh, we were hands-on. We were, again, in the middle of COVID, scrambling for materials. We were running some materials up there. But just the fact that he has his own Avenger team, Mm -hmm. right, Rob? I mean, Rob talks about that all the time, um, that they will only work directly with that general contractor. They do not want to work with Home yeah, they owners. won't be subbed out with other people. No, whatever, no, but. they 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 need people to speak their language. They need them to s- tell them when to show up, when things are actually ready, not when. Oh, can you come by and give me a quote? And you're still in. You've torn yeah. everything apart. And- people waste contractors' times all the time without realizing that they're doing it. It's just exactly. it, out of ignorance, people will do that. Oh, can you come give me a quote? And that contractor's got to take time off a job, drive till two to three hours of time that they're going to spend. Then they got to talk to you. Then they got to go draw up the quote. That could be like a half a day or a day's worth of work that's gone. And then the job never happens. Yeah, and then never hear from you again. Yeah, exactly. But, oh, well, he was cheaper. So I went with him. And they just, we're not right. saying that you got, you got to hire everyone on the first shot, but people are not aware what they're asking for when they're like, I just want to get a quote. Right. My family was blue collar workers. My dad was a painter. My uncle and my grandfather were painters. I saw the work they have to go into just to generate a quote. It's not a thing. It's like asking someone to comp a house. You're not just going to look at it and give an answer. You're going to go dig in and dive in and spend a lot of time doing that. And so that you end up finding exactly what you said. The best people stay loyal to the person that butters their bread, protects them, takes care of them, keeps feeding them. Mm -hmm. And if you are that good sub and you take too many side jobs and your contractor finds out, he might be looking to replace you with someone that he can count on when he wants to go get the job. And that is something I found when you try to cheat the system and you're like, I don't want to hire a contractor. I'm just going to go find my own person. You're often getting someone that couldn't get full-time work working for a contractor. And right. I love what you said because we sometimes think we're saving money doing this. I mean, I am guilty of this just as much as anyone else where that contractor said 15K, I can find a guy to do it for 9,500. I'm going to save some money. And then the job takes three times as long exactly. and you make three $5,000 mortgage payments. And you're like, this just turned into a $50,000 remodel, but I only had to pay 9,500 for it. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your experience What's that like say? With you're that? tripping over pennies to save dollars? dollars? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, when we broke ground, I was like, we need to finish this in eight months. I, that was a tall order. I, yeah, know. I was going to say that's ambitious. It's ambitious. So, but when you're seeing the rate interest rates going up expeditiously, I mean, so by the time from when we broke ground 
to when we got CFO was 15 months. And the interest rates rose 400 BPS. And for everybody at home, that's certificate of occupancy? Certificate of yeah. occupancy, yes. Which is what the the city or, or county has to issue saying you are allowed to use this as a yes. residential. Yes, and even from the lending standpoint, because we were refinancing, they want to see a certificate of occupancy. They don't want to lend on something that can't be used if they have that to foreclose is, that no one could live there. Right, it needs to be finished up to a point of being safe to live in. And at that point, we weren't done, to be honest. We were still waiting on backsplash. Um, I don't know what else we were waiting on. Just, just cosmetics. Well, you, have to have cosmetics. you have to have well, flooring. The thing. You have to. Um, what are some of the things that you need to have for it to be a habitable flooring? I think it part has to of be it. like cabinets have to be in there. Cabinets. No, no exposed electrical or plumbing. That all has to be there. Which is fair. Just but, yeah. but some of the cosmetic stuff that is true. Like you right. can the backsplash might not be there. Paint might not be finished. It Dishwasher. Can, it's like past. Yes. I think it's like um past rough like electrical where the electrical outlet is like all wired up, but you don't need the plate on it necessarily. Yeah. And so people can use that information to get deals because I've looked for properties, not so much recently, but in the past when there was less competition where they were like 98% of the way to certificate of occupancy, but like they had a, uh, they would have had like the, um, what's the word I'm blanking on the subfloor in with Hardy backer, but no tile. And they're like, nope, can't live in that house. It just has the hardy backer, right? Well, like I'll go in and buy it knowing we just have to lay tile right on there. But my competition could not get a loan to buy the property Mm -hmm. because a lender won't lend without the CFO, right? So I can go in and pay cash for this thing because it's uninhabitable, but it's not a complete tear down. It's not a huge project. That used to be a strategy that we could use. Now it's just something you have to be aware of, like you're saying, because you can't refinance until you actually get that. So what are some other blind spots? We've mentioned uh, the certificate of occupancy. We've mentioned knowing what needs to go into running comps to see what the property is going to be worth. You mentioned that you got your own contractors instead of trying to work the subs yourself. What about some of the stuff like rough-ins or contractors ghosting you for work not getting done? Have you guys had any issues with that? Well, the punch list, that was the after certificate of occupancy, there's the punch list and them coming back for it takes a long time. Yeah, because at that point, you've basically paid the most <laughs> yeah, the I, Yeah, for, for the yeah. most part, there are maybe 10% uh, waiting on the 10% of that final punch list. <gasps> and at that um, point, they've like started <laughs> another job where the big oh, money's yes. coming in. They're, the foundation yes. 25% uh-huh. milestone hits. This is one of those things where if, if an investor could just take one thing to get right, it would be do not pay the contractor all the money to start the job. But it's weird that they almost don't even... They're like, okay, 10%, I think I'm good. I don't... They don't need the last 10%. They don't need the last 10%. Because they're making making the 90% on the other sucker that pays them all the money up front to go start that other job. And then they finish that one halfway through. At least we get ours to 90%, right? That is a, it's such a crucial thing. You have to give them some money because they, they're not going to front their own money to buy materials and pay their labor. But I typically try to keep it around 20 to 30% to start the job. And then I just stay in contact with them. And as they show me that the work has been done, I give them another, another draw. What you don't want to do is give them 80% of the money, 100% of the money right off the bat and trust that they're just going right. to finish yeah, the crazy. job, right? Yeah, it, right? For sure. A hundred percent of the people that have been ripped off by a contractor that I've talked to, mm-hmm. that come to me, what do I do? Do I need to take them to court? They're not returning my calls. I just ask one question. Did you already pay them? There's that dot, dot, dot. It's always that. Yes. No, man. <laughs> Usually my, my, so a punch list is basically where y- your house is basically done, but you have all these little things that the follow through wasn't quite there. Or there's like a drywall crack that needs to be patched up or something that needs to be touched up with paint. And so it's this list of things that you give your contractor and you say, Hey, I need these things to be done. The dishwasher's not beautiful. running. Yeah. The, the electrical outlet wasn't wired correctly and it's not working. It's like when you walk a new home, if you ever had a new home that was built, this is where they put the blue tape. Yes. On the walls, uh-huh. right? Like, hey, get, come in and have the person fix this last thing. You hung the wrong lo- the wrong lighting fixture in the wrong area. The doorbell doesn't work, whatever that stuff is. And then none of us know how to fix that. Yeah. We're going to go in. Really, though, a handyman has basically done all my punch lists ever. Yes. So we did have to come have someone bring someone up from Denver to finish out some of the punch list items just to get it to the point where I could shoot pictures. <laughs> so, you know, the, those are... The, the just it's always at 10 percent yes the last that 10%. takes that 10 percent is that's the why longest. you want that big juicy last 25 percent draw yeah. hanging over their head Ew. and that it's funny like have you ever had a dog you try to get to do a trick and and they don't want to do it when your company's over but then you put a treat in your hand and all of a sudden they remember how to roll over 
That's exactly yes. how I look at it. Like it's amazing how you remember how to finish that punch list when there's another twenty five to thirty percent coming. But when you're holding like a, a piece of broccoli to the dog, that's like the ten percent. You know, I'm not really that hungry. I'm not gonna roll over for that. But they would eat the broccoli if it was in a bowl of food. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they would get it done if it was part of what they what they yes. needed to do to get paid. That's a great point there. So I understand you have a shower door story. Can you share that with us? Yes, the shower door story. My contractor, I was like, I need the shower door. I, I mean, I guess I could hang a shower curtain, but we want a, a shower, a glass mm-hmm. shower door. And he's like, okay, I'll call my guy. I said, who's your guy? He tells me. I'm like, I called that guy. He's like, well, he's my guy. That's the That's Avenger funny. team. Yeah. So that guy will answer the contract yes. calls. The, the guy, the, the glass dude said, I'm too busy. Except the contractor, as David said, butters his bread. Yes, yes. he does. <laughs> That's right. I mean, if we're going to go with that, that <laughs> dog trick analogy. I'm not trying to compare contractors to dogs. I realize that could have gone All in a the bad way. are like, how dare you? But it's like when you're like, you know, like your little sister's yelling at the dog. It doesn't do anything. And then like dad walks up and boom, sits. Right. Because it's like, I'm not miss- making that guy mad. He's the one that feeds me. Right. It's that same idea. Right. As you came along and they're not loyal to you. They're loyal nope, to the person. Exactly. Who their bread. Exactly. So you, you really do. It's again, that, that time that, cause I would have been high and dry trying to find call home Depot everywhere and, and then transport this thing myself and have mm. my handyman go and install it where this guy goes in and cuts this piece of glass and comes back with it. Perfect. That, you know, I mean, it's custom yeah. pr- pretty much. So, it, it it was just the time frame of launching on Airbnb and that really that helped to just really he did come back. I mean he's mm-hmm. a good he's a good contractor, but yeah, like you said, he's on to the next job because he needs to get his timelines going. His he has milestones to to make on all of his other or the jobs. next three jobs, sometimes. right? Yep. Yeah, they're juggling Starting them multiple. All at the same time, and right. he's and so we only look at our situation, our house. The contractor is like this middleman who's trying to deal with the clients that want things done. They're usually not math geniuses or business gurus like it sounds like you and your husband were pretty good at this but i don't think everyone has a janice working their books on the back end okay they're struggling they don't even know how to bid a job then they get the job and now they have to manage like a herd of cats getting their employees to show up and work every day there that industry is notorious for having people that do not want to show up and work from nine to five or nine to nine they've got issues they've got drama they're fighting with their girlfriends they're stealing your tools they're a lot of them get into to drugs and they're unreliable like it's always a, a challenge is they're like how do i get my labor on all these different jobs and then they got to pull someone off this job to come well when there's delays for anything and during the timeline we were building there was just delay after delay and it wasn't really a, the contractor's fault is mm, materials it's materials and there's just normal delays in in construction yep. if you period. have to go through the permit process right but i think it's like i think the most frustrating thing though is whenever the you do have all the pieces and all the materials and you drive by your house and like <laughs> nobody's there and you know that the contractor's just at another job doing a different job and you're like man i literally can't and you were bragging about only gone. paying ninety five hundred. That other person was willing to pay fifteen grand. Right. Their job's getting their done. Their job is done. And yours is not. I always, yeah. I do say that. I mean, sometimes I think, when you win, you really lose. Especially in short term rentals, I think it's very important because you'll sometimes might have to pay three or four thousand dollars to get done a month or two earlier. But what revenue would you have made exactly? In a month or two? Exactly, it could make you. You could be making like five to ten thousand well, dollars more. Interest rates too. I mean, yeah, yeah. There's you have a story about that, don't you? Like in in one of the cases, you broke ground. The time from breaking ground to receiving your certificate of occupancy the rates rose by 400 basis points yes so we ended up having to pay down the rate and now looking back at that rate where we were we are at 8.8 we were quoted Mm 8.75 and we we paid two points down so I mean, it's. But you were originally around in the mid fours. In the mid fours when, when we we got quoted. Yeah. yeah, that caught me on several of them. Yeah, actually, it just happened to be when I bought a bunch of houses right after that. There's nothing you can do. Yeah, no, you can't. No. That's a great point. Time is often more expensive than the money that it would take to get the job done faster. Right, because if you that amortization over thirty years or yeah, versus it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars. and so. You know, the other po- point of hiring a general contractor for that area is that 
they know the the permitting department. They know the inspectors. Okay. That's nice too. It's not like I'm calling. Can you come and do a rough in, uh, inspection of my electrical? Um, that'll be two weeks yep. versus my contractor calling. Okay, we'll be there tomorrow at, yes. at nine a.m. Yeah, <laughs> a good contractor, yes, can get anybody on the phone because they're just trusted. Yep. So, all right. So you kind of worked it out with your contractor. You get this house done. Can you tell us a little bit about how it actually went? Did it did it perform well? Like, were you crushing it out the gate? How did it actually go when you launched on Airbnb? So the other timing factor is that we. Um, Missed the summer season. Mm. And that's a busy season and for you? And that's a busy season. Okay. But, you know, we launched in the fall. It, we have leaf peeping season. So we, I, out of the gate, I mean, it was a success. We have been operating for five months now. So on average, we're doing gross 7200 a month. A month? A month. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have our our, our shoulder seasons here. But that's pretty good, considering you know our, our net is anywhere from four four thousand to forty five hundred, which is solid. That is good, that's especially when I pulled out all all the money that I initially invested. Yeah, right. I have it's infinite return. Infinite returns. So you put all your money in, you get it back. This is what I call getting a free house. Everyone on YouTube gets mad though because they're like, "It's not a free house if you still have to pay a mortgage." It's a free house in my mind. It's a free house because someone else is paying my yeah, mortgage. Yeah, that's right. And then you basically make. Forty-eight to fifty thousand dollars a year in profit. Yes, and if you did that twice, you make six figures. Not yeah. only is it a free house, it's a free fifty grand. It's yeah, yes. It's that exactly. Everybody else yeah. is giving you these things, which is how investing works when it's done well over time. All right, so you figured out how to get a free house, and you figured out how to get free revenue. Obviously, you're going to want to do more of this. So, what's what project are you working on now? For sure. So, we're doing. We're going in on scale. We want to do eight eight units, which that's our next project. Eight, eight micro cabins in Salida, Colorado. And it's it's the exact same model. That's a great location too. It for is. Short term rentals. It's it's there's 14ers, if you guys know what they are. People love to come and hike them. Um, a lot of river river activities. So it's a it's a great market. And I'm I'm basically doubling down on what I did with the A-frame, but doing it on one Basically, outdoor hospitality is what you're what octupling down. Yeah, you're doing eight units. Yes, yes, yeah. good catch. Down. <laughs> Definitely a down. word. Yes, and then what? Ten xing on my other project that I have um, in Buena Vista, which is close by, and that is on thirty nine acres. So that is a, is a different play because it's located in an opportunity zone, and there's a, a bigger learning curve there. But I'm building my Avenger team. Dang, that's cool. So you're really, you went from sprinting on a new construction, which is really what it feels like on your first build, to now you like entered the marathon phase, like you're in it to win it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm making up for lost time is what I'm doing here. So um, with those properties, you know, I get a lot of people asking me, how can I do this? How can I buy land? Mm -hmm. And um I just, land is probably the most crucial piece. And uh, with these particular properties, I worked backwards. I worked from looking at what the zoning maps are and going, I'm not going for conditional use or special use. I'm going straight for use by right. And so with the eight unit micro cabin resort, that is zoned for campground, which is hard to find. Given it's it's only one acre, but the fact that I could st go straight to permitting gives me speed of that speed again. That's going straight to construction. So when you say use by right, that just means it's zoned for that. Thus, you don't have to go through crazy conditional use permit or special no, use permit no applications. No planning and zoning. Wow, cool. So when you're talking about buying land, you mentioned that people ask that question. We've also mentioned that buying land can be the difference between a deal that works and a deal that doesn't. What are some things people need to be aware of when buying land? So my top red flags um, whenever I look at a piece of land is number one, flood flood zone. Deal breaker for me, Not maybe not for some people, but that's if it's located in a flood zone, I will not do it. In insurability issues, potentially building issues. Along with that goes with um, if something's in a wetland, those two go hand in hand. You more than likely can't build. Um, Utilities is a big one. Mm -hmm. Water, sewer, electricity. 
all of the things that we take for granted. If you if those things are not on site or reasonably close by, it's going to be very expensive. I mean, even if it's reasonably close <laughs> oh, yes. by, electrical yes. can cost tens of thousands of dollars if it's like Correct. 100 yards away. It's crazy. Right, right. Yeah, I had someone call me go, I think it's a half a mile away. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, if you ever like go on Zillow or Redfin and you see these beautiful pieces of land, they're like, 100 acres and they got views of the mountains and there's like a spring and in the photo there's like this little baby deer and you're like oh my gosh it's only twenty seven thousand dollars and it's like there's a reason yeah, why is that there's cheap. no utilities anywhere for like miles yeah exactly exactly and then th- what goes along with that is um accessibility if there's no road or if you have to build a road or if it's landlocked by right. other neighboring adjacent properties, that's going to make it Meaning somewhat Meaning you can't difficult. get into this property Correct. because you have to go it to somebody to, else's right. property to get For my, when, Whenever I do my due diligence, it has to have public access. Um, what's another red flag? Um, site grade's a very big one. Anything above 15, I won't do. What does that mean? 15% 15. grade. Okay. That will just make it expensive for your your dirt work. Mm. Um, then you have other foundation things that you you will have to do. And um, it just, it's, I go for either anything 10% and below. Um, so water is, is a pretty big one. Um, that is a big variable if, like Rob said, we all want this beautiful piece of land. But there's no public water going to these parcels. And the variable is digging a well. You don't know how far you, you're going to have to dig. Um, and on my project, anything that is above, that's going into the eight to 10 dwellings or units, they're deeming those commercial. So if we're doing a commercial well, that's a whole different animal. And water is public. It's it's not something that you could just go and apply. I want a commercial well permit. Certain counties will have you go in front of a water court and you have to get a water engineer to basically state your case on why. You know, there's just so many intricate things that we all don't, we're not, we don't have any of that expertise. So mm-hmm. it just gets expensive to do that. This is so, people always say, hey, I just want to build because it's too expensive to buy. What do you think about that? I, there's so much to it. I, I couldn't even warn you of all the things you have to know about. Cause how many people would have thought of any of these things right. on their own? If there's like, Oh, no, 27 grand. The hard way. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. So let's sum up. Was it five, five things that we went over five there? Five things. Yes. So we had water access and uh, the utilities rights. in general. Yep. Utilities. Sewer. Okay. Uh, the site grade, the site grade, floodplain, floodplain. And was and there wetlands one? with that? Um, the other one was zoning and zoning. Yes. Zoning is a big one. Because if you can't build what you envision, then you're stuck with a piece of land that you can't do anything on. Other than try to sell it to someone else who hopefully doesn't know how the (laughs) process works too. (laughs) That's what happens all the time too. You see these beautiful pieces of land and they're like, we've already got the the plans drawn up and everything. You're like, oh my gosh, they've done all the hard work. And then you like ask the realtor a question. They're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. the. Why would you ask that? I don't know. Uh, got to figure it out. It comes, with, like, it comes with plans. Yeah. You're like, you just didn't that tell me $3 million dollars to run the electrical <laughs> yeah. into where these plans were drawn up for. Okay, well, this has been fantastic. I think you're the first person we've talked about that gives us this much detail into building properties and how easy it is to mess that up. So I appreciate <laughs> you sharing this with all of our audience who may have had these harebrained ideas that they're going to run into this thing without knowing what they're doing. My personal opinion, you should leave development to the experts and I don't recommend people get into it unless they know an expert. And I think you seconded that by just talking about having the right construction people, having the right contractor, having your Avengers that know how this works can make the difference between losing a lot of money and having a successful project. Is there any last words you'd like to leave the audience with? Well, I mean, if you do want to build something and it's along the lines of a single family home or even a cabin, that's probably going to be your easiest point of entry. If you're thinking, oh, I'm going to do a, a multifamily development. Okay. It's if you go into any any county or, or municipality and you go, I want to build a house, they're going to say yes. Again, it's it's the permitting. Yeah. So that's that's going to be the path of least resistance. So do you have any advice for people that want to learn more about this? Like what would you tell your your niece if she wanted to get into development? 
Um, well, I'm actually doing a little bit of consulting and putting out some information on un- Uncommon Developer. Mm-hmm. If you want to check that out, I'm, I just started that because I get the same questions over and over again. Is that your website? Or your, it's my uh, website. Cool. Um, my Instagram, yes. My Instagram um, for the A-Frame is Backcountry A-Frame, and I share a little bit about that process um, in the highlight reels. So, that, you know, I'm, I'm very transparent about the, the process and the cost there. Okay. Rob, where can people find out more about you? You can find me on the YouTubes over at Rob Built, R-O-B-U-I-L-T, and on Instagram at Rob Built as well. What about you? You can find me at Big Five Sporting Goods looking for some new socks because my feet are freezing from walking in this snow. And after that, you can find me at David Green 24 all over social media and my new website, davidgreen24.com. I'm one of the only old people left who is still making websites. Although I guess Uncommon Developer, right? That's a website. It's yeah, like, oh, we're I coming just, back. I just made a website yesterday. No way. I just named my direct booking website. I'm really excited. What is it? It's called neeksleeps.com. Neek? Yeah, like unique. N i q u e uh, n e e k sleeps dot com spelling it cool. Is this like when, cool. You, when you try to put like an X in something because that makes it cool, like Spanx. Well, I was gonna do Neek Lee, but I know that you don't like when people just add the L Y at so the end. Don't like so that. living in the Silicon Valley area for too long, they just started to add L Y to the end of any word and call it a tech company. Shirtly, chairly, couchly, computerly, podcastly. Yeah, it's everywhere. Hey, you, right, ever, well, you ever wonder where the, where the, the term podcast comes from? That's no. a great question, Bob. You want to get into that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, off-air jokes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Janice. We appreciate you sharing your story. It's been fantastic as well as some of the struggles that you had and the doubt that you had before you jumped into what you're doing right now. So thanks for coming here. We'll make sure that we check in on with you and see how that project goes. And I'm glad that Rob brought you in. Thanks for having me. This is David Green for Rob Neek Abasolo signing out. <laughs> <laughs>